Volume 3, Book 6, Thermidor. And so we reach the point where Carlyle must go through the nadir of the revolution, where Jacobin reaches its ascendancy, reaches its moment of utmost absurdity whilst being in power. And then there is a Thermidorian reaction. And we start with chapter one. The gods are a thirst. What then is this thing called la Révolution, which, like an angel of death, hangs over France? It is the madness that dwells in the hearts of men. Paralytic Couthon asking the Jacobins, what hast thou done to be hanged if the counter-revolution should arrive? A sombre saint juste, not yet six and twenty, declaring that for revolutionists there is no rest but in the tomb. Here, Carlyle references Georges Couthon, elected to the Committee of Public Safety on the 30th of May, 1793, and was a close associate of Robespierre, and, of course, the other being Louis Antoine de Saint-Just, similar close conspirator with Robespierre. They feel that everyone is the enemy, and uh, until you've gone to your own tomb, you have not been fulfilling your obligation as a revolutionary. This is the mindset of those in and around Robespierre. Is not the property this nature of San culottism consummating itself, of which Erebus blackness be it enough to discern that this and the other dazzling firebolt, dazzling fire torrent does by small volition and great necessity verily issue in such and such succession, destructive so and so, self destructive so and so, till the end? Royalism is extinct, sunk. That's where we are in the in the course of our revolution. In the mud of the Loire, republicanism dominates without and within. What, therefore, on the 15th of March, 1794, is this? Arrestment, sudden really as a bolt out of the blue, has hit strange victims. Hébert, Père Duchesne, Bibliophist, Mumoreau, Clark Vincent, General Ronsin, High Cordelier, Pat Patriots, red-capped magistrates of Paris, worshippers of reason, commanders of revolutionary armies. But the worshipper of a reason, commander of revolutionary armies, is no longer good enough for the likes of saint Just, for the likes of Couthon. They don't trust the likes of a general Ronsin. So in early March, the rests continue. Oh, it's, it must be Pitt. Some sort of financing from Pitt, this idea of the Pitt paranoia. Pitt, indubitably, as preternatural insight will teach one, did hire this faction of enragés to play their fantastic tricks, to roar in their Cordeliers club about moderatism. So there's a Cordeliers club, they're mentioning moderatism as a way forward for France. Now this was, this was still a, um, quite a revolutionary club at the time, it existed from 1790 to 1794, the Cordeliers, a populist club, uh, one thing, direct democracy, uh, a sort of liberal vision for France. This was beginning more to corrupt into the power or to poke at the power of Robespierre and constant revolution. They foresaw the revolution done and you needed to get universal sovereigns, suffrage and more, de more democratic means into the French institution rather than constantly looking for revolutionary ideas. But that is still revolutionary in and of itself. We'll worship sky blue reason in red night red nightcap. This is the charge against the Cordeliers. They are worshipping sky blue reason in a red nightcap. They are not actually of the revolution or the red nightcap themselves. Rob alters and bring the spoil to us. The Cordelier club sits pale with anger and terror and has veiled the rights of man without effect. Likewise that the Jacobins are in Considerable confusion, busy purging themselves. C'est pour rien. Not even Camille Desmoulins, but has given offence. Nay, there have risen murmurs against Danton himself, though he bellowed them down, and Robespierre finished the matter by embracing him in the tribune. But we're beginning to see the murder. Robespierre now trusts no one but his own inner circle, and Desmoulins and Danton are merging away from it. Whom shall the Republic and a jealous mother society trust in these times of temptation? Preternatural insight, factions of the stranger, l'étranger, factions of the moderates, of the enraged, all manner of factions. Representative Philippot is purged out. He came from a lavande. 
with an ill report in his mouth against a rogue Rossignol and our method of warfare there. So even critiquing what they'd done at Nantes and the Vendée uh, sees you as an enemy. You cannot critique the regime or anything it has done in the name of revolution. Vesterman, friend of Danton, who led the Marseille on the 10th of August and fought well in La Vendée, but spoke not well in the, of this rogue Rossignol, is also purged out. Oh, the great heart of Danton is wary of it. Danton has gone to the native Arsis for a little breathing time space so Danton gets away from Paris. Not necessarily the right move at such a, such a moment. The great titan walks silent by the banks of the murmuring ob in young native haunts that knew him when a boy. Wonders what end of things may be. Strangest of all, Camille de Milan is purged out. December last, began, he began publishing a new journal, a series of pamphlets entitled The Vieux Cordelier, Old Cordelier Camille, not afraid at one time to embrace liberty on a heap of dead bodies, begins to ask now whether among so many arresting and punishing committees that there ought not to be a committee of mercy. Saint Just, he observes, is an extremely solemn young Republican, carries his head as if it were a saint sacrament. Camille, translating out of Tacitus from the reign of Tiberius, pricks into the law of suspect himself. Camille's first number begins with O Pitt. His last is dated to the 15th of Pluvios, year 2, or the 3rd of February, 1794, and ends with the words of Montezuma's Le Dieu en Soif, The gods are athirst from whence the chapter gets its name. So Camille is looking at this younger generation, the likes of Saint-Just, and he doesn't understand their their fermentation, their religiosity, their sense of zeal with the revolution. The revolution becomes a preternatural insight. But for Camille, he still wants a reason, liberty. He's thinking of 1789, he's thinking of the days of the Bastille. Be this as it may, the Herbatists lie in prison only some nine days. On the 24th of March, therefore, the revolution tumbrils carry through the life tumult. A new cargo, Hébert, Vincennes, uh, Mamoreau, Ronsin, 19 of them in all, with whom, curious enough, sits Klutz, speaker of mankind, if you recall the Danish man who wanted to... or the Dutchman who wanted to bring in... Uh, a representation of this in in new assembly of international reason. Saint Guillotine, me seems, is worse than old saints of superstition, a man devouring saint. Klutz, still with an air of polished sarcasm, endeavours to jest, to offer cheering arguments of materialism. General Ronsin, too, he still looks forth with some air of defiance, I have command, the rest are sunk in a stony Paleness of despair, Momoro, poor bibliopolist, no agrarian law yet realized. These were all pe people who, sort of, G Girondins in orbit. Ronsin, his command not trusted. Uh, Momoro, wanting uh, some sort of agrarian law which which would go against now <laughs> this vision of, uh, of Robespierre. They might as well have hanged th uh, the at Evro 20 months ago when Girondin Bouzeau hindered them. So there we go, association of Mamoreau with the Girondin Bouzeau. Nineteen spectre chimeras shall flit, squeaking and gibbering, till oblivion swallow them. The revolutionary army itself is disbanded, the general have be having become spectral. The revolution then is verily devouring its own children. All anarchy by nature of it is not only destructive, but self-destructive. A key Carlylian rule. Chapter 2. Danton, no weakness. And so we must understand the fate of Danton. Danton, meanwhile, has been pressingly sent from the Arsis. He must return instantly, cried Camille, cried Philippot and friends, who, was, who sent a danger in the wind, danger enough. A Danton, a Robespierre, chief products of a victorious revolution, are now arrived in immediate front of one another, must ascertain how they will live together, rule together. One conceives easily the deep mutual incompatibility that divides these two. With what terror of feminine hatred the poor sea green formula, that of Robespierre, looked at the monstrous colossal reality Danton. And um, it is strange, I mean, Carlyle has always called Robespierre that sea green, more feminine. Uh, looking frail in the assembly. Danton is a striding colossus, represents reality, represents the 
successorship of Mirabeau in terms of the reality, the king of France, even if not king by name, king by nature. Yeah, two such chief products are too much for one revolution. Two stars can keep not their motion in a single sphere, if we recall the quote of Shakespeare in Henry the Fourth, Part One. It is right, said Danton, swallowing much indignation, to repress the royalist, but we should not strike except where it is useful to the republic. We should not confound the innocent and the guilty. And who told you, replied Robespierre, with a poisonous luck, that one innocent person had perished? The man Danton was not prone to show himself to act or uproar for his own safety. A man careless, large, hoping nature, a large nature that could not rest. He would sit whole hours, they say, hearing Camille talk, and liked nothing so well. But the man Danton sat still now. Not even the arrestment of friend Hero, member of Salou, yet arrested by Salou, can rouse Danton. We reached the 30th of March. Juryman Paris came rushing in. A clerk of the Salou committee had told him Danton's warrant was made out. He is to be arrested this very night. Danton sat silent for a while, then answered, Il ne sera rien. They dare not. Rumour spreads over Paris city. Danton, Camille, Filippo, Lacroix have been arrested overnight. It is verily so. Danton arrested. Well, who, who then is safe? Danton's prison thoughts were curious to have, but are not given in any quantity. Indeed, few such remarkable men have been left so obscure to us as this titan of the revolution. I dragged down Robespierre. Oh, it were better to be a poor fisherman than to meddle with the governing of men. Camille's young, beautiful wife, who had made him rich not in money alone, hovers around Luxembourg like a disembodied spirit day and night. Ulysses Politlas, at the limit in that most gaze of his voyage, gazing into that dim waste beyond creation. Stand ranked at the bar of Tonville. It is the 2nd of April, 1794. Danton has had but three days to lie in prison. Your name? Place of abode? And like Fouquier asks. This being the bar of Tonville, uh, Fouquier. Antoine Quentin, Fouquier Tonville. He has been the public prosecutor of the Revolutionary Tribunal for some time now. My name is Danton, answers Danton. A name tolerably known in the revolution, my abode will soon be annihilation, dans le néon. But I shall live in the pantheon of history. Camille also uh, is under this interrogation, and he answers, My age is that of the bon saint Jésus. An age fatal to the revolutionists. Camille's real age, it would seem, is 34. Danton is one year older. Some five months ago, at the trial of the 22 Girondins, was the greatest that Fouquier had then done. But here is a still greater thing to do, a thing which tasks the whole faculty of Fouquier. For it is the voice of Danton that reverberates now from these domes, in passionate words, piercing their wild sincerity, winged with wrath. He demands that the committee men themselves come as witnesses, as accusers. He will cover them with ignominy. What about that town that of this uh, accusation that he was hidden then on the 10th of August? He reverberates with the roar of a lion in the toils. Where are the men that had to press Danton to show themselves that day? I demand, I will unmask the three shallow scoundrels, Le Trois Plats, Coquin, Saint Just, Couthon, Leba. These, of course, the men, the accusers, who fawn on Robespierre and lead him toward his destruction. Well, it turns on a hair. On the evening of the second day, matters looking not better but worse and worse for Fouquier and a man, distraction in their aspect, rush over to the Salut Public. Is there not a plot in the Luxembourg prison? Salut rushes off, with it to the aid of Tonville, reduced now almost to extremities, and so, hors de debat, out of the debate, see insolence, keep the crowd away from Danton. Policemen, do your duty. And then the verdict comes in, death this day. So they want to cut Danton out of the picture before the public get to put pressure on the trial or put pressure on the whole proceedings and the whole jurisprudence. 
It is the 5th of April, 1794. Camille's poor wife may cease hovering about this prison, nay, let her kiss her poor children and prepare to enter it. Danton carried a high look in the death cart. Coniferous rabble are now howling round, palpable yet incredible, like a madman's dream. At the foot of the scaffold, Danton was heard to ejaculate, O my wife, my well-beloved, I shall never see thee more then, but interrupting himself, Danton, no weakness. I will show my head to the people. It is worth showing. So passes like a gigantic mass of valour, ostentation, fury, affection, and wild revolutionary force and manhood, this Danton, to his unknown home. He was of Arsis sur Orb, born of good farmer people there. He had many sins, but one worst sin he had not, that of Kant. No hollow formalist, like Robespierre, deceptive and self-deceptive, ghastly to the natural sense, was this, but a very man, with all his dross, he was a man, fiery real from the great fire bosom of nature herself. He saved France from Brunswick. He walked straight his own wild road, whither it led him. He may live for some generations in the memory of men. Chapter 3. The Tumbrils. Next week, it is still but the 10th of April, there comes a new 19, Chomet, Gobel, Hébert's widow, the widow of Camille. These also roll their fated journey, black death devours them. Gobel, it seems, was repentant. He begged absolution of a priest, dies as a Gobel best could. Wretched and sacarous God shall judge thee, not I. Let no Paris municipality, no sect, no party of this hue or that resist the will of Robespierre and Salut. This confusedly electric Erebus cloud of revolutionary government, as Carlyle describes it, now haunts the wider French Republic. It is swift and ever swift. And it goes to the axe of Samson. It is the high day of death. None but the dead return. Oh, dusky de Premenil is there. What a day is this, 22nd of April, thy last day. We must go right back to the to our early chapters to get uh, a lowdown on de Premenil, the speaker of the... Parliament of Paris. The Palais Hall here is the same stone hall where thou five years ago stood, stoodest perorating amid endless pathos of rebellious Parliament in the grave morning, bound to march with Douglas to the Isles of Hier. Seems like a different world ago. The stones are the same stones, but the rest, the men, the rebellion, the pathos, the peroration. See, it is all fled. Like a gibbering troop of ghosts, like the phantasms of a dying brain, with the Premenil in the same line of the Tumbrils goes the mournfulest medley. Chapelier goes, Cidavan, popular president of the Constituent, whom the Minards and the Maillard met in his carriage on the Versailles Road. So a lot of earlier players now are getting devoured. Thure, likewise, Cidavan, president, father of the Constitutional Law Acts, he whom heard saying long since with a loud voice the constituent assembly has fullest has fulfilled its mission but clearly the revolution had not fulfilled its and that is Carlyle's point another row of tambrils we must notice to which holds elizabeth the sister of louis her trial was like the rest for plots made up plots real plots half plots paranoid plots the royal family is now reduced to two a girl and a little boy and these are, namely, uh, the royal princess, the Duchess d'Angoulême, and Louis Charles, who was separated from Marie Antoinette on 3rd of July, Poor boy hidden in a tower of the temple, uh, from which in his fright and bewilderment and early decrepitude he wishes not to stir, lies perishing. The spring sends its green leaves and bright weather, bright May, brighter than ever. Death pauses not, though. Lavoisier, famed chemist, shall die and not live. 
This is Antoine Laurent de Lavoisier, um, French nobleman and chemist. Lavoisier was a famed chemist, but he was also from the arist aristocracy. Uh, and he had gotten his fame through the Ancien Regime. An interesting case where you have this enlightened scientific empiricism of Lavoisier, but it's using the Ancien Regime methods, and he is eventually uh, charged for tax fraud for funding his own scientific research through means not agreeable to the revolution, and he meets his end. Cynic Champ 4, reading these inscriptions of the Brotherhood of Death, says it's the Brotherhood of Cain. The notabilities of France disappear one after one, like the night's lights in a theatre which you are snuffing out. Brotherly supper, spontaneous or partially spontaneous, in the 12th, 13th, 14th nights of this May month, her own night, with cheerfully pledged wine cup hobnobbing to the reign of liberty, equality, brotherhood, with their wives in ribbons, and with the little ones romping on the citoyen and frugal love feast, sit there, night in a wide empire, sees nothing similar. Color shouts murder, with lungs fit to awaken at the Rue Favard. Amiral snaps a second time, a second time flashes in the pan, then darts up into his apartment, and after their firing, still with inadequate effect, one musket at himself and another at his captor is clutched and locked in prison. He denies not that he meant to purge France of a tyrant. So this is the assassination attempt on himself, uh, on Jean-Marie Collot de Bois, who was a French actor, dramatist, uh, and revolutionary member of the Comité de Salle de Publique and um, more associated with administrating the terror in Lyon. But there is an attempt on his life. So there's a similar thing here where the, these members of the Comité de Salut Publique, the Comité de Salut Publique are getting targeted the same way Morat was targeted by Corday. Paper dealer's daughter, a young woman of soft blooming luck, presents herself at the cabinet makers in the Rue Saint Honore, desires to see Robespierre. Robespierre cannot be seen, she grumbles irre irreverently. Poor Cecile, examined by committee, declares, wanted to see what a tyrant was like. Such things come at, of Charlotte Corday. In a people prone to imitation and monomania. So even Corday gets her own imitants here, trying to bring down whether it's Jean-Marie Collot de Bois whether it's Robespierre himself. These are failed assassinations, but they're trying to replicate what Corday had managed with Marat. Oh, pit any faction of the stranger shall the public never have a rest. Of course, gives fuel to Robespierre to continue uh, narrowing his immediate circle and growing his list of enemies. Chapter 4. Mumbo Jumbo. But on the day they called Decadi, New Sabbath, 20th Priorale, 8th of June by Old Style, what thing is this going for, the Jardin National, Wailum, Tillery's Gardens? All the world is here. Citoyen and citoyenne. The weather of the, is of the brightest, cheerful expectation lights all countenances. Improved anti chomet principles. Chomet, of course, was in the second batch of 19 who met their end the previous month, or two months ago in April. It is a new religion. Catholicism is being burned out and reason worship is, guillot is guillotined. Rational Republican religion, this now. It is, as Carlyle calls it, the Mahometan Robespierre moment. In sky blue coat, black breeches, frizzled, powdered to perfection, bearing in his hand a bouquet of flowers and wheat ears, issues proudly from the convention hall, convention following him, yet, as is remarked, with an interval, clear leader now. It is the sea green pontiff. He takes a torch, painter David, handing it, mouth, some other froth rant of vocables which, happily one cannot hear, strides resolutely forward in sight of expectant France, sets his torch to atheism and company. They burn up rapidly, and from within there rises by machinery an incombustible statue of wisdom. And what is this but, of course, our feast of the Etre Supreme? Our new religion, better or worse, is come. As Carlos says here, he may as well have uttered the mumbo-jumbo of the African woods, in fact, they seem venerable beside this new deity of Robespierre, for this is a conscious mumbo-jumbo, and knows that he is a machinery. Ah, oh, sea-green prophet, unhappiest of windbags, blown nigh to bursting 
What distracted chimera among realities art thou growing to? And of course, this feast of the supreme being will be seen by many to be the moment at which Robespierre goes too far in the eyes of the uh, public or in the eyes of the even the committees and his not his immediate surrounding group, but those slightly outside of it. They're fearing for themselves, and then they see this feast. He is at the front of it. Everyone else trailing behind. He has become a Mohammed Robespierre of this supreme reason. Carlyle looks at another figure, Catherine Thayer. Catherine Thayer would night Robespierre finds that this astonishing thrice potent Maximilian really is the man spoken by the prophets who is to make the earth young again. She, of course, was a sort of clairvoyant visionary at the time, um, prone to hallucinations. Mumbo is Mumbo, and Robespierre is his prophet. Conscious man is this Robespierre. He has his voluntary bodyguard of tap d'eau, let us say, strike sharps, fierce patriots, with fjerled sticks and jacobans kissing to the hem of his garment. He enjoys the admiration of many, the worship of some, and is well worth the wonder of one and all. Will not this feast of the Tuileries mumbo-jumbo be a sign, perhaps, that the guillotine is to abate? Far enough from that, though. Precisely on the second day after, it is Couthon, one of the three shallow scoundrels, gets himself lifted into the tribune, produces a bundle of papers. Couthon proposes that, as plots still abound, the law of suspect shall have extension and arrestment, new vigour and facility. Revolutionary tribunal, too, shall have extension. So the cult of the supreme being is twinned with Couthon enacting or extending these laws of suspects. It's the uh, Couthon's decree of the 22nd Priorial. The very mountain gasped, awestruck by the, the ostentatious behaviour here by Robespierre, Couton, Sanchez, and the like. The incorruptible knit his brow, spoke a prophetic fateful word or two, the law of Prairial is law. Fouquier is enlarging his borders. Tonville Fouquier, prosecutor of the Revolutionary Tribunal. Making room for batches of 150 at once, getting a guillotine set up of improved velocity and to work under the cover in the apartment close by, so that Salou itself has to intervene and forbid him. Wilt thou demoralize the guillotine? asks Colo. Reproachfully, demoraliser la supplice. So the guillotine now becomes this sort of thing not to be demoralized. Um, it becomes something sacred. We reach the 17th of June. What a batch, 54 at once. Swart Amaral is there, is here. He is of the pistol that missed fire. Young Cecil Renaud. Uh, with her father, family, entire kith and kin, the widow of de Premenil. Assassins and factions of the stranger, they flit along their red, baleful phantasmagery toward the land of the phantoms. Chapter 5. The Prisons. When Demilon moved for his committee of mercy, these twelve houses of arrest held five thousand persons. Continually arriving since then, there have now accumulated twelve thousand. They are Cidamonts, Royalists. In far greater part, they are Republicans of various Girondins, Fayetteist. Remember Lafayette? Uh, an un Jacobin colour. The plot in the prison rises. The idea that they made the prison so full, there's plots now in the prisons. By City on La Flotte, a preternatural suspicion, suspicious municipality snatches from us all implements. This plot of the prisons, as we said, is now the stereotype formula of Tonville, against whomsoever he knows no crime. This is a ready-made crime. His indictments are drawn out in blank. You insert the names after. This is the plot of the prisons. Tonville uses those already in the prisons to say they have a plot, and now their fate should be worse than simply prisoner. Nightly come his Tombril to the Luxembourg, with the fatal roll call, the list of the Fernet of tomorrow. And now clanks in really the machinery of the guillotine. This night to the conciergerie, through the palais misnamed of justice, to the guillotine tomorrow. Almost a conveyor belt from prison to guillotine. Tonville himself, in his turn, is doomed and not to the guillotine alone. And still the prisons fill follow though. The Tonville moment will come later. Still the prisons fill fuller. Still the guillotine goes faster. On all high roads march flights of prisoners wending towards Paris, not Cedevants now. They, the noisy of them, are mown down. It is Republicans now. 
Chained two and two they march, in exasperated moments, singing their Marseillaise. So everything must be tried in Paris now. A great decentralized political machinery is at work. The Jacobins to the marrow, to the marrow of the bone. They are wayworn and weary of heart, these Republicans, marching towards their fate. Chapter 6. To finish the terror. Since the Etre Supreme feast, Robespierre has gone little to the committee. Talion is at home by recall long since from Bordeaux, and in the most alarming position. This is Jean Lambert Talion. who have been active in this revolutionary. He was a spokesman of the section of the Place Royale in 1792, when we had the Legislative Assembly. He wanted the reinstatement of Pétion, and sort of swim in a Danton circle. Uh, this Talion, but he's now home from uh, Bordeaux, and Robespierre growled at him words of omen from the Convention Tribune, seest thou not that thy own head is doom, thou, with a too fiery audacity, a Dantonist withal, against whom lie grudges. So we have Talion beginning to, will he now be the opposition? We have a Danton-shaped hole in this Convention. Freron is hated in Barat. Each man feels his head is, if yet, stuck on his shoulders. This is Paul Francois, Jean Nicolas Barat. And of course, we have a final Louis Maurice Stanislas Freron. Now, Freron and the likes of these, you know, he still would have voted for the execution of Louis, Louis XVI. But he, here he is turning himself back from the Robespierre version, the Feats of Supreme Being. And he's teaming up with Barra, and the Talion is back in. They want to go back to something more sane. These 40 days, for we are now in July, has uh, Robespierre has not shown his face. Talion, Barra, and Ferrand, though they fear for their head, the head on their necks, are still in the committee. The incorruptible himself sits apart or is seen stalking in solitary places in the field with an intensely meditative air, some say with eyes red-spotted. O hapless Chimera, for thou too hadst a life and heart of flesh. What is this that the stern gods, seeming to smile all the way, have led and led thee to? His plans for finishing the terror? One knows not, this of Robespierre. Dim vestiges there flit of agrarian law, a victorious sanculottism to become landed proprietor, Old soldiers sitting in national mansions, in hospital palaces of Chambord and Chantilly. Peace, bought by victory, breaches healed by feast of supreme being. Blessed shore, of such a sea of aristocrat blood, but how to land on it. Is there this idea that Robespierre can see the shore here? It's difficult to know. Though one last wave, blood of corrupt sanculottists, traitorous or semi-traitorous conventionals, rebellious talion, bios, to whom, with my etre supreme, I have become a bore, with my apocalyptic old women a laughing stock. Some say that the convention to be butchered, down to the right pitch by General Henri and Company, Jacobin House of Lords made dominant, and Robespierre dictator. From the dinner table, Carnot glided out, driven by necessity, needing, of all things, paper. Groped in Robespierre's pocket, found a list of forty, his own name among them. So you see, Carnot recognises that even him trying to stay on Robespierre's side will still find his name on a list. And so we reach the 8th of Thermidor, 26th of July, 1794. Robespierre himself reappears in convention and mounts to the tribune. Unmelodious as the screech owls sound that prophetic voice, degenerate condition of the republican spirit, corrupt moderatism. Maximilian alone left uh, incorruptible in his own eyes, ready to die at a moment's warning, for all which, what remedy is there? Well, the guillotine, the new figure of the all-healing guillotine, death to traitors of every hue, so sings the prophetic voice. Honourable members hint dissonance, committee members... Inculpated in the speech, utter dissonance, demand, delay in printing of these names. The order to print and transmit, which had got passed, is rescinded. Robespierre, greener than ever before, has to retire, foiled, discerning that it is mutiny, that evil is nigh. Mutiny is a thing of the fatalist nature in all enterprises whatsoever. Things so incalculable, swift, frightful, not to be dealt with in fright. 
But mutiny in a Robespierre convention, above all, it is like fire seen sputtering in the ship's powder room. If Robespierre can, tonight, produce his Henriot and company, and get his work done by them, he and saint culottism may still subsist some time. This idea of the Jacobin House of Lords. Robespierre, for his part, glides over at evening to his Jacobin House of Lords. So, <laughs> Carlyle is saying, in essence, in reality, this House of Lords already exists or is beginning to, to take its existence in and around Robespierre, the places he attends, Hotel de Ville, uh, when he's not in the convention. We will make a new June 2nd. In this key pipes of Jacobal, Jacobinism, the sheer tumult of revolt, let Talion and all opposition men make off the new june 2nd well they're talking about the day of the the purging of the girondins a year before in, in june 1793 sleep can it fall on the eyes of talion Fleron, colo puissant Henriot, mayor Fleurio, judge cofignal procureur payan robespierre and all the jacobins they're getting ready so we move on to chapter seven go down to Talion's eyes beamed bright on the morrow, 9th of Thermidor, about nine o'clock, to see that the convention had already met. Paris is in rumour, treated with a pride's purge. Pride's purge, of course, Carlyle referencing his other great revolutionary uh, occupation, that of the English Civil War. Pride's purge, the expulsion of the parliamentarians from the House of Commons uh, by Colonel T. Pride, and the establishment of the Rump, 6th of December, 1648. Saint-Just is verily reading the report of his... Green vengeance in the shape of Robespierre watching nigh. Talion, second time, with his Citoyen, the Jacobin last night, I trembled for the Republic. This is Talion speaking. I said to myself, if the convention dare not strike the tyrant, then I myself dare. And with this I will do it, if need be. Said he, whisking out a clear, gleaming dagger and brandishing it there, the steel of Brutus, as we call it. Tyranny, dictatorship, triumvirate. And San Justice standing motionless, pale of face. Robespierre still struggling to speak. President Turio is jingling the bell against him. Descending again. Coming, going, like the choke with rage, terror, desperation. And mutiny is the order of the day. Robespierre speaks. To you, O virtuous men of the plain. The virtuous men of the plain sit silent as stones. The blood of Danton chokes him, they cry. Incorruptible Maximilien is decreed accused. Turns back on Robespierre. The Talion move has come good. Couthon and Saint-Just and Le Bar, they're all decreed. Huge city holds in it so many confusions, 700,000 human heads, not one of which knows what its neighbour is doing, nay, not what itself is doing. But Robespierre's not in prison. The jailer showed his municipal order, durst not in pain of his life admit any prisoner. He's in the town hall. And there sit Robespierre and company embraced by municipals and Jacobins and sacred right of insurrection, redacting proclamations, sounding toxins, corresponding with sections in mother society. They're trying to rustle up all the support they can have here in this convention coup, this Thermidor. Is not here a pretty enough third act of a natural Greek drama, catastrophe more uncertain than ever? He'll raise a force. He will die at least with harness on our back to reference uh, Shakespeare, Macbeth. The poor prisoners in the Luxembourg hear the rumour they tremble for a new September. When, of course, all the prisoners were killed. September Massacre, 1792. The death tumbrils faring southeastward through Saint Antoine towards their Barrière du Trône. Pain has sat in the Luxembourg since January. Pain is in prison and seemed forgotten, but Fouquier at last pricked him. The dissident armed forces have met. Henriot's armed forces stood ranked in the Place de Grève, and now Barat, which he has recruited, arrives there, and they front each other, cannon bristling against cannon. Armed force Henriot against Barat. Henriot for Robespierre, Barat for the Thermidorians. Citoyen cries the voice of discretion loudly enough. Before coming to bloodshed, to endless civil war, hear the convention decree you read, Robespierre and all rebels out of law. Out of law? There is terror in the unsound. Unarmed, Citoyen disperse rapidly home. Municipal cannoneers in sudden whirl, anxiously unanimous, range themselves on the convention side with shouting. Henriot announces all is lost, loses a nerve. Miserable, it is thou that, that has lost. Saint-Just, 
they say called on Labat to kill him. They just realized they did not have enough numbers, I think, cornered in this Hotel de Ville, this town hall. Couton crept under a table, attempting to kill himself, not doing it. Robespierre was sitting on a chair with pistol shot blown through, not his head, but under his jaw, the suicide hand had failed. So he mutilates his jaw, but he doesn't kill himself. Robespierre lay in an anteroom of the convention hall while his prison escort was getting ready. They mangled jaw, they picked it up and bound up rudely with his bloody linen. It was a spectacle to men. He had on the sky blue coat he had got made for the feast of the Etre Supreme. Report flies over Paris as on golden wings, penetrates the prisons, irradiates the faces of those that were ready to perish, turnkeys and moutons. Fallen from their high estate, like mute and blue. It is the 28th day of July, called 10th of Thermidor, year 1794. Fouquier had but to identify his prisons being already out of law. From the Palais de Justice to the Palais Place de la Révolution, for thither again go the tumbrils this time. The death tumbrils. With the motley batch of outlaws, some 23 or so, from Maximilien to Mayor Florio and Simon the Cordwainer, they roll on. A woman springs on the tumbril, clutching the side of it with one hand, waving the other sibyl-like, and exclaims, Death of thee gladdens my very heart. Mon ivre de joie. Robespierre opened his eyes. Sclera. Go down to hell with the... Curses of all wives and mothers. So now the crowd are with the Thermidorians. Samson wrenched the coat off him. Samson, the executioner, wrenched the dirty linen from his jaw. The jaw fell powerless there. Burst from him a cry, hideous to hear and see. Samson, thou canst not be too quick. Samson's work done, there bursts forth shout on shout of applause. Shout which prolongs itself not only over Paris, but over France over Europe, down to this generation. Stricter man, according to his formula, to his credo and his cants, cant, of probities, benevolences, pleasures of virtue, and such like, lived not in that age. His poor landlord, a cabinet maker in the Rue Saint-Honoré, loved him. This is of Robespierre. His brother died for him. This is the end of the reign of terror, new glorious revolution named of Thermidor. Thermidor 9th, year 2, which being interpreted in old slave style means 27th of July, 1794. Terror is ended, and death in the Place de la Révolution, while the tale of Robespierre, once executed, which service Fouquier in large batches, is swiftly managing. And of course, this is the end of Robespierre, and Carlyle has given it to us in biblical terms. The reports flying over the Paris on golden wings. Golden wings, a reference from Psalm, the book of Psalms. Down to this generation, this idea that Rupert echoes down to this generation, why Carlyle there is invoking Luke. And so this, this biblical man, this man of, two men of biblical proportions here of Paris, Danton on the one hand, the man of reality, this Colossus, and then the, the frail effeminate man of formula, this Robespierre, botches his own suicide and... Uh, eventually falls to the Thermidorians and to Samson's judgment.